Good afternoon. Good afternoon. to be in the chapel today and have the chance to preach and to be a part of communion on a day as important as this one at Union. Many days at Union are important, but today is particularly important because we are launching what is the beginning of four days of very intense activity in the city of New York with participants from around the world gathering to make a strong statement about climate change and to do so in our context at Union with the summit we are about to host from a faith perspective. It's a rare and precious moment. I am completely convinced that everyone in this room, I probably won't be saying this 50 years from now, but 50 years from now, those of you who are still around to say it will be astounded to tell their children, their nieces and nephews, their neighbors, that they were here for this event. This morning, we began the whole celebration and serious conversation with a gathering in the social hall where former Vice President Al Gore discussed with a gathered group climate change, faith, and the hope that we have to move forward as people of faith and deep conviction. The group gathered in the room was very significant with respect to this conference because it is a room full of black and Latino clergy from New York City who have long been on the forefront of struggles for social justice and for human rights in this community. It was also a community gathered of people who have, because they are communities of color and predominantly poor communities, felt the brunt of the effects of climate change most excruciatingly. This evening, from 5 to 7, we will open the summit itself with a reception where we are inviting our guests from around the world to gather, to have a meal together, and to welcome them to Union as they begin their conversation. But what is so remarkable about the group gathering, like the group this morning, is it is not a group made up primarily of, if I can, hand-wringing white Protestant liberals in the United States who feel quite guilty about climate change. It is a gathered group of religious leaders from many religious perspectives from around the world, many indigenous communities, and across the board communities that have, like this morning's group, experienced disparate impact with respect to the effects of climate change. In this context, what is the word that God speaks to us here at Union Theological Seminary? Over the next three, four, and hopefully five, six months, years, and decades into the future, we are going to hear a lot about this issue grounded in faith communities. And we will hear wise and wonderful things from traditions very different from those gathered in this room right now. Traditions maybe some of us are not even aware of. We will hear words familiar and strange but the question here in this moment of pause in the middle of the day is what word is there to be said to us? The scripture passage this morning is very interesting. It's the lectionary passage. As I was uh, plowing through the lectionary, thinking about all different approaches to this topic, I was struck by the story of Joseph. Now I ask you, before I begin to unfold the story again, to think about where you find yourself in this story. It's a remarkable story. We know the story that has preceded it. We have heard of the terrible act of violence that the brothers do to their own brother out of jealousy, out of greed, out of unbridled will for destruction and domination. And yet here we are at the end of this story of ever escalating violence that has now come to be a violence that is narrated in terms of massive droughts and the collapse of an economy. And there is the one who is wronged sitting at the center of it, suddenly in the position to receive the pleas, the earnest pleas of the brothers. 
It's a moment in scripture where you don't know the story, and even though I do know the story, I still do it again. You hold your breath. And it goes through your mind all of the things, like the brothers, that Joseph could in his right claim do. And they invoke their dead father. They invoke, they set on the table in front of this whole family gathered there, their dead, dead father. And with his body, with the body of the one who brought them to life, with the body of the one who created the conditions of their conflict before them, the one who stirred their jealousy, the one who did not tend to the raising of siblings who would love one another, the one who is, in a sense, the most responsible, lying dead before them, they ask for forgiveness. And Joseph, and Joseph weeps as they begin to weep. And they sit there and they cry together. In the midst of collapsing governments, in the midst of horrific drought, with brothers who are starving, on the edge of this catastrophe, they weep. And then Joseph forgives them. And he says, I'm not forgiving you just because I want to forgive you. I'm forgiving you because in the vast cosmos in which we find ourselves, you and I and all of us are forgiven by the God who loves us. I just returned last Monday from a trip to South Africa where I was in Cape Town participating in a conference called Theology on the Edge, where theologians from around the continent gathered to think about what are the cutting edge issues for theology in an African context. I came away with many lessons, but here are two I want to share with you today. The first is that the effects of climate change that we're very aware of here in New York, through things like Hurricane Sandy and we see in Staten Island and the far Rockaways, the way in which poor communities continue to be devastated by it. In South Africa, by the millions, are refugees flooding in because of climate catastrophes of drought and flooding around the continent. Having 20 years ago had their first election, of a new democratically elected government, South Africa is now having to deal with the potential of a doubled population within the next 10 years, a people who, in terms of their experience, not only have no memory of apartheid, but come from context with histories of violence parallel to their own, but with nothing except the clothes they wear to bring with them around Cape Town as around Johannesburg and Durban and Pretoria, as well as in the countryside. Huge shanty towns are growing up next to the former townships, such that it makes the life in the townships struggling to have proper housing look luxurious compared to those shanty towns. And there's the sky above them bearing heat because of the sins of the brothers, of the brothers and sisters, of the members of the human family, who are all of us, who are us first world consumers. The clothes we're wearing, the fuel that makes the buses run around our city and fuel our cars, the processes by which these buildings have been constructed. And the list goes on and on. We literally, all of us in this room, wear the clothes of the brothers. And we wear them in different ways, with different histories. We have participated in, in, dif in disparate ways. But the truth is, we are part of a community called North America who is responsible historically for almost 85% of the carbon emissions that are now collapsing our atmosphere, 
and all of us who live in this culture are implicated. One of the struggles they're having in South Africa right now is the excruciating rise of domestic violence and rape. One of the ways in which the South African theologians are talking about that is to say we need to recognize that apartheid didn't just end because we elected a new president. It damaged us, and it damaged us deeply. And climate change damages us, damages us all deeply. And when they talk about the damage done by apartheid, it's not just a comment about a single group of people. It is a comment about a systemic damage that comes when decades and centuries of violence are perpetrated upon human bodies. One of the most moving moments for me was in the midst of this conference. Most of the theologians have worked together for decades. Almost all of the white theologians there were very active in the move to topple apartheid. But at one moment in the conversation, they were asked to sing, to sing the song that carried them through the anti-apartheid movement. And this is the song they sang. I can't sing, so I'm going to tell you the words. <laughs> we are sorry. We are oh so sorry. We are sorry for all the harm we have done. We are sorry. We are oh so sorry. We are sorry for what we've done. And it continues. A mournful acknowledgement of the disparate impact <coughs> of harm upon bodies and an acknowledgement of even those who have participated in the struggle, laid their lives on the line, still acknowledging how they, at a systemic level, participate and reap the privileges of their whiteness. In a sense, they're putting themselves in the role of Joseph's brothers. When we hear the story, we don't like to think of ourselves as Joseph's brothers. It brings to mind the fact that when we hear the story of Jesus' crucifixion, we like to think of ourselves as the disciples gathered around the cross, grieving the loss and the death of this one who has gone. We don't like to think about the fact that we are more the Romans. We're more the high priest. We are those who have participated and benefited from the execution that has happened in corners of our world to our planet and the layers upon layers upon layers of deaths that have come because of it and are sure to come in the future. I think one of the biggest challenges we have as we activate as communities our own theological instincts and insights and hopes into this struggle is that we are going to increasingly move into a world that as the effects of climate change become more apparent, there is reason for great despair. In fact, there is reason for despondency. There is good reason to give up hope. So I asked one of the white Afrikaners from South Africa to talk about that song. It was John de Grucci. And he described how when that song was sung in the harshest days of apartheid, there was something that happened in that mourning and that claiming of history, that acknowledgement of agency that was life-giving and hopeful. And that is to be our challenge. That is to be our challenge. What does it mean 
to acknowledge as people of the first world, as people who live in the middle of that site from which great toxins have flooded, bringing death to many, how do we mourn and not lose hope? How do we claim our responsibility and not collapse under the weight of a despair that comes from recognizing what we have done? How do we do that? There's not an answer to that. There's not an answer to that. That's the hard truth. There's no easy answer to it. But we know from our scriptures that deep in the Christian tradition is an insight that mourning and a sense of implication in harm can sit side by side with an unfettered hope in the promises of God to the world. Joseph says, I didn't forgive you just because I wanted to. I forgave you because God forgives, and God forgives because God wells the universal well-being of all. If our despair collapses us, then we are not the forgiven creatures that God is freeing in order to participate in the struggle that will make our planetary well-being possible. But we become those who have refused any forgiveness. Joseph forgives because the mission and tasks of God are greater than his own anger or his community's, his brother's guilt. Today we celebrate together at this table, and we do per perhaps the oddest possible thing that a group of people could get together and do on a Thursday afternoon in the middle of the city of New York. As we prepare for these discussions about climate, things painful, things hopeful, things eye-opening, we do this. We gather around a table, and we do this weird thing in which we both tell the story about a terrible act of violence in which a good man was hung up on a cross before everyone and killed, and his body was broken and his blood flowed, and everyone thought the world had come to an end, and for a moment it had. So we, this table insists that we tell that, that terrible story. We can't escape it. The cross sits there at the center. And yet, Paul tells us, and as we come to this table, we somehow believe that in the midst of telling that story and remembering, life happens. Life happens. We are so sorry. We are sorry. We are so sorry. We are sorry for what we have done. Take this bread and drink this wine and proclaim my death until again I come. Amen.